Good morning and welcome to Seton Hall University's 2022 Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day Symposium. I am Karen Passaro and I have the pleasure to serve as Continuing Education and Professional Studies Dean here at the University. This day has become a tradition for students, faculty, scholars, the extended Seton Hall family and our local communities, including town and state leaders, congregations and school districts. With the adaptation of virtual programming, we are also grateful to welcome participants far outside of our New Jersey area. We have come to know MLK Day as a holiday. Like most other holidays, this can be a joyous day, one where we learn, where we reflect, learn and reflect some more on the meaning of service to our fellow human beings and recognize that we each have a role to play as we learn to understand history and make the decisions to do something, to do more to recognize the absolute right that each person is equal to each other and therefore each person needs to live and thrive within a society based on equity for all people. It is in the spirit of Dr. King that we are here together today. We will honor his life, his deeds, and most importantly, his impact. In this, we can see that individuals still have that role to play to continue toward a more just and equitable society. It has been said that there are not many absolutes in life. Based on my work with Dr. Fars Pritchett and esteemed faculty scholars in these areas, I can tell you that there are a few absolutes today. One, you will feel uncomfortable today based on discussions, images, and the retelling of tragic events, you may experience sadness, horror, anger. Secondly, it is okay to discuss issues of race and equity, even if it makes you uncomfortable. And third, you will see triumphs accomplished by people who have heeded the call to action for a better society. We are grateful that you have taken the time to be with us. Accept that gratitude as you begin your day with service to yourself, which will have an impact on the whole. Today's program will be two sessions. The first morning session should conclude about 1145 and the afternoon session will begin at 1230. Thank you for being here. I am pleased to introduce the 21st president of Seton Hall University, Dr. Joseph E. Nyer. Dr. Nyer is a Naval veteran and a first generation college graduate who obtained three advanced degrees and completed pre and post doctoral studies at the University of Missouri, University of Kansas and Harvard Medical School. A prominent researcher and psychologist, President Nyer has taught and led at many prominent universities across the country while developing state and federal legislation to advance access to healthcare and education. President Nyer joined Seton Hall in the summer of 2019 with a clear focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, elevating the academy and fundraising for student and faculty distinction. President Nyer believes that universities have the responsibility to advance the dialogue and solutions to the great challenges of our time. Please join me in welcoming the 21st president of Seton Hall, Dr. Joseph E. Nyer. Good morning, and thank you for inviting me to celebrate and learn with you. I wish we could be together, but no matter where we are, this is a day of inspiration and hope. After all, it was Dr. King who showed us to keep hope alive no matter what. And as we consider his legacy, may we find engagement, enlightenment, and encouragement to advance his vital work of nonviolence. I'm especially proud that Seton Hall is hosting this event. I wanna thank Reverend Dr. Pritchett, our faculty members, students, speakers, performers, and guests. Your dedication has made this symposium a reality and the schedule is simply phenomenal. Allow me to offer a special welcome to guests from outside Seton Hall. By way of introduction, we are a Catholic university committed to the welfare of all God's people. And we strive to instill students with a commitment to something greater than themselves. We seek to do more than teach and learn. At our best, we engage, serve, create, care, and improve life for the human family. Dr. King told us, make a career of humanity, commit yourself to the noble struggle of equal rights, 
you will make a better person of yourself, a greater nation of your country, and a final world to live in. Make a career of humanity. What could that look like? Last year, I'm pleased to share that we received a gift to endow the Martin Luther King Jr. Scholarship. This scholarship is unique. It opens doors for excellent students who have overcome economic and educational hardships. It fosters diversity in an intentional way, and it lets us advance Seton Hall's legacy as a college that serves people of limited means. This gift was made by University Regent and alum, Matthew Wright. Matthew attended Seton Hall on the same MLK scholarship, and thanks to him, it will be available to our students forever. Matthew has made a career of humanity. He received an opportunity to transform his life and change his destination at Seton Hall, and now he's expanding that opportunity for future generations. May we do likewise. And may we do likewise when it matters most. This is not a time of plenty for universities. COVID costs and inflation require institutions to count every penny, but that shouldn't and won't prevent us from serving our most deserving students. So I'm proud to share that Seton Hall is allocating an additional $615,000 to the MLK scholarship Matthew Wright so generously endowed. And we are embarking on a major effort to grow that scholarship even further through private philanthropy. As we continue to advance, as we continue to transform the structures and ideas that deny equal rights for all people, we need days like today. We need moments to revitalize our strength. We need time to restore our souls. And we need occasions to advance our knowledge. And we need moments to express our frustrations and celebrate our progress. I know today will provide those opportunities and many others. So thank you for joining us. Have an engaging and enlightening and inspiring symposium. God bless you. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here today at the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day Symposium. My name is Dr. Jerita Marie Frierson. I typically go by Dr. G, and I'm the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Seton Hall University. It is an honor and pleasure to provide academic remarks for today's event. The memory of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., his messages and actions must be remembered not just on today, but every day. The importance of, of race and also culture and ethnicity must permeate our classrooms, learning activities, and discussions. We must continue to learn from each other and about one another. No one view is acceptable. Diversity, equity, and inclusion is in the heart of academia to produce the best life learners, our students. This is why we're here today. We are students of Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King as well, because we are life learners. I personally incorporated his messages in the foundation of my research as a social scientist working to eradicate health disparities among Black and Latina breast cancer survivors. As a Black academician, I would not be where I am today without the hard work of my parents who attended the same HBCU, Historical Black College University, like I did, which was Hampton University in Hampton Roads, Virginia. Then going to schools like Ohio State and Brown University, where I was one of only few Black students. I am thankful and give the utmost respect to Dr. Martin Luther King. We hear about his father and his grandparents who influenced him, but also his mother as well. And that's why I brought up my family that has led me to my academic journey, journey that stands on his legacy. I am also honored to be part of today's outstanding event um, where academic freedom includes tough but real discussions on race, ethnicity, culture, and social justice, which is part of our diversity, equity, inclusion platform here today. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Reverend Valencia B. Norman, pastor of First Presbyterian and Trinity Church at South Orange. Thank you. Friends, today as we celebrate the life and legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., we are reminded of his radical nature, his radical idea of the dependence that we have on one another. So let us pray. 
Today, oh God, we beg for every disarmament that you can bring to us, disarmament that comes with securing better lives for all of your children, no matter their color, their nationality, their ethnicity. We are bold to pray, oh God, for an immediate end to the pandemic that we're facing in health and the political arenas, for the abolition of handguns, semi-automatic weapons, all kinds of weapons of mass destruction that challenge the lives of your children. For all of this, oh God, we believe that we can also pray for the relatives of those whom have faced violence, police brutality, and other destructions that has come upon them, that you could give comfort to them and to their relatives. We pray, O oh God, for those who are facing insecurity in housing, in areas of nutrition, education, and dignity. We pray, O oh God, for every child, that they can have all that is needed in order to be their best selves. God, we pray for the climate, that we will work together to end this global warming. We also pray for an end to any injustice, for the policies that ignore the bodies and the lives of, of women, for those who are different, for those who are facing any kind of challenge right now. And especially we pray for those in this arena of a public pandemic that all people can feel safe. We pray, O oh God, for a conversion of our gospel, a gospel that is one of truth and concern for all of your people. God, help us as individuals and as a world to hear now your proclamation. Seek ye first the kinship of God and God's justice, and all these other things will be added unto you. So move us beyond our cultural and our individual narcissism so that we can be compassionate to the whole lives of those around us. Lead us, O oh God, to your realm of peace, working for that sign of justice that we can see, letting us stand on the mountaintop, O oh God, watching and working together until we see your doves of peace coming to descend upon us. O oh God, we pray for the end of all of these things, and we proclaim together the healing for the oppressed and for the oppressor, and for the coming reign of peace, love, and nonviolence here and now. May all of our prayers be heard. May all of our prayers for justice be answered. In your name we pray, amen. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Dr. Muhammad Ali Chaudhry. I'm president of the Islamic Society of Aspen Ridge. And I'm honored to be a part of this Martin Luther King Day seminar on peace. It is very important for us to recognize that in Islam, my very faith means peace. And I'm going to return to that in a moment, but I'd also like to share with you uh, some of the <clears throat> other involvement that I've had with the interfaith community. In addition to being president of the Islamic Society of Askin Ridge, trying to build a mosque uh, in our town, I am co-founder of the New Jersey Interfaith Coalition. I have served on the Board of Education in my town many years ago and also as mayor. And today, I think of all the mayors around the country who are worried about the safety of their area, safety of their citizens with the risks that we are facing. So. Later on, I want to include that as a thought for prayer. I also would like to share with you that I am a professor at the Raritan Valley Community College. I'm an economist by training. 
and I have continued to teach uh, one or two courses a semester, uh, whenever I have time. So coming back to our topic for today, I would like to share with you from the Islamic tradition, the importance of recognizing the humanity of all human beings, all creatures of God. And in that spirit, I'd like to share with you one of the verses of the Quran, the Islamic scripture. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ya Yohannasu, inna khalaknakum min zakarim wa unsa, waj'alakum shu'uba wa qabaila lita'arafu. In Akramakum in the Lahi Atkakum in the Lahi Munkhabir. I just recited the verse in Arabic and it translates O mankind, indeed, we have created you from male and female and made you peoples and tribes that you may know one another. Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah, which is the Arabic word for God, is the most righteous of you. Indeed, God is knowing and acquainted with all that you do. This verse is repeated in many different ways in the Quran to emphasize that God created all human beings from the same source. And therefore, we are all one, brothers and sisters. And in fact, uh, one of the Shia Imams has said that if we are, we are either brothers and sisters in faith, or we are brothers and sisters in humanity. The point being that God created all of us and made us different. Diversity was a part of the design of the creator. And we should cherish that. We, see, we should see that as a strength and build on our strength, recognizing what every human being, no matter what background they come from, how they worship, uh, how they dress, what language they speak, that how what they can contribute uh, to the life around us. And honestly, when I generally think about these large topics, I always recognize the standing in Basking Ridge or South Orange or Newark or any other place. My responsibility extends most importantly to the people around me. So while we talk in generalities, I mean my neighbors, my friends, my coworkers are all important in my life. And in fact, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has reminded us many times that you are not a good follower of the faith if people around you are afraid of you. So what does the peace mean to you? That is, you have to act in a way with people around you that they feel you as a protector, as a friend, as a partner, not as a threat of any kind. So from the Islamic tradition, there's a lot more that we can talk about as far as peace is concerned. Uh, but I would like to uh, <clears throat> follow our tradition and in the interest of brevity, offer a very simple prayer for peace. O almighty God, the creator of the universe, sustainer of the entire universe, we ask for your forgiveness. We ask for your mercy. We ask for your blessings. And we ask for your peace and help us 
understand the differences we all face. Help us understand the other. We are currently dealing with a tremendous amount of anxiety and fear. It is your blessings. It is your mercy that will allow us to deal with it. We ask you to bless us with your <clears throat> video mercy because I will end with this final prayer in Arabic and will translate it into English. Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam tabarak tayaz al jalal wal ikram. O oh Allah, you are the perfect peace, and peace comes from you. Blessed are you, O oh owner of majesty and honor. Amen. Hi, everyone. I'm Rabbi Karen Glazer Perlman. I'm one of the clergy at Congregation B'nai Jeshurun, uh, just down the street on South Orange Avenue in Short Hills, New Jersey. And uh, it's a blessing to be with you uh, on this uh, day of peace, in this gathering of peace. And um, on these days, this day actually every year, when we think back to the legacy of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., I think back to the photo that I was shown as a very little girl, which was uh, Dr. King and uh, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel walking arm in arm uh, in the southern part of our country, marching for peace. Uh, there's actually another one of rabbis holding a Torah scroll as they would walk, um, as they marched uh, dur during the civil rights era. and uh, Rabbi Heschel was quoted as saying that when he was marching, he felt like his feet were praying, that through that action, he actually was able to pray, not in the synagogue, not with the prayer book, but really that it was through action uh, that he was able to pray. And that has been a guiding light for many Jews who um, seek peace in this world and who desire a world not of violence and of hatred and of incivility and of separation, but really of unity and kindness and compassion and peace. The prayer for peace that um, many Jews say in Hebrew uh, prays that God is an Ose Shalom, God is a maker of peace. This prayer, I'll recite it in Hebrew and then I'll share it in English. This prayer says, O say shalom be mramav, hu yaase shalom aleinu, ve'al kol Yisrael, ve'al kol yoshvei tevel, ve'imru amen. May the one who we call maker of the peace who makes peace in the high heavens, make peace for people here on earth, for Jews and Christians and Muslims, people of all faiths, brothers and sisters of peace people who walk and share God's great earth together. Together we say, Amen. My brothers and sisters, my name is Father Colin Kay. I am campus minister, director of campus ministry here on the South Orange campus of Seton Hall. And I am also your interim vice president for mission and ministry. Every member of the community is a member of the community. I think that's where we begin. We belong to one another. St. Paul insists in that first letter to the Christians of Corinth, the 12th chapter. We are individually members of Christ's body. We are very much in this together. So we pray together to the one Lord who calls us to love one another and through one another to love him. Good Father, we ask you, open us 
open our eyes and our ears, our minds and our hearts to your life, to your love in us and through us and all around us, and most especially in one another. We make this prayer as we always pray through Christ our Lord. May the Lord bless us, protect us from all evil, and guide us safely along our way in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I am the Reverend Dr. Forrest Pritchard. I am the program director for the Martin Luther King Leadership Program at Seton Hall University. That program was started in 1970. We are probably one of the oldest programs in the United States of America, which is dedicated to um, the life, the legacy, and philosophies of Dr. King. We are very proud of that tradition. We have produced a couple of generations now of scholars who have, if you would, gone into the world with their gifts and made the world a better place. So very proud to continue that legacy now into the 21st century. We are now going to enter into a, uh, a period of litany, a litany that devoted uh, to the life and impact of Dr. Martin Luther King. I'm going to ask you all to put your attention on your screen. And as we um, recite this litany, we will ask everyone to uh, read the portion, which is, um, I believe, designated as the congregation. I will uh, lead as the leader. I'm going to ask all of my presenters also to unmute yourselves. And please, uh, you may read as a congregation also. And that way, we'll be getting a little verbal feedback. In every era, God has chosen men and women to serve the needs of his people. Such a leader was Martin Luther King Jr., whose birth we celebrate. We are deeply thankful for the life of this 20th century prophet. May the wisdom and words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. rekindle our faith. May the deep love that Dr. King had for all people be released in us. That we too might work miracles in the lives of those who continue to hate. Dr. King Dr. taught that, taught that only love can overcome, can overcome hatred. Bitterness and fear. May his struggle for social transformation continue into this generation. May all people come to believe that with perseverance we shall overcome. But let justice, justice roll, roll down, down like down waters, like waters and, righteousness and righteousness like an, like an ever-flowing ever stream. stream. May the work of Dr. King continue to eradicate racial justice and its ungodly consequences. Dr. King pursued his dreams, dreams of racial equality. Oh. By appealing, by appealing to the conscience, conscience of, of his enemies. enemies. May we continue to cultivate the nonviolent discipline of Dr. King, abandoning unrestrained acts of force. He taught us that a heart us full, that of heart full of grace and love, and love is just, is just as, as important as, important as, as an education. education. May the spirit of Dr. King continue to flow through our daily living. 
He believed in self-respect and dignity, even though he knew that there would be difficult days ahead. May we have the courage of Dr. King as we continue to stand up for justice, reconciliation, and truth, despite challenge and controversy. Dr. King Dr. said that the war is never, is never a victory, victory regardless of the, of the outcome. outcome. May the peace of the risen Christ cause the fury of war to vanish from the face of the earth. Dr. Dr. King Dr. went to the mountaintop. He saw the promised so, land, land and he and reassured us that we will get there, get one, there day. one day. God of glory God be with us with on us the, journey. the journey. Amen. I want to thank the, uh, this new congregation. I think you did a great job, and I believe Dr. King would be very proud of us at this moment. It is now my pleasure um, to introduce uh, to some and present to others uh, the university provost, Dr. Katia Passerini, my boss. Dr. Passerini joined Seton Hall on June the 5th of 2020 as the provost and the executive vice president. She oversees and directs the academic affairs division of the university, which encompasses nine schools and colleges. Prior to Seton Hall University, Katya was the Leslie uh, H. and William L. Collins Distinguished Chair and Dean of the Collins College of Professional Studies at St. John's University. From 2003 to 2016, she was Professor in the Holbert Chair of MIS, Management Information Systems, and the Dean of the Albert Dorman Honors College at NJIT. Her research focuses on knowledge management, mobile applications, and computer-supported learning. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Katia Passerini. Thank you, Reverend Pritchett, for, for the introduction, but um, most importantly, for the invitation to join this day of reflection and remem remembrance. Um, I'm sorry that we are yet again virtual, but I'm glad that we are together. Thank you also for your tireless work and commitment to all of our students, but especially uh, the MLK scholars who are here today with us. And I suspect that you also had something to do with region rights um, and, and your teaching have deeply influenced them. Thank you. I've seen the impact that you make on our students firsthand, and I'm really grateful. I'm also very grateful to the entire Seton Hall community for the commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion across the entire university. Last year when we met, we talked about our new strategic plan that we just launched, its goals, its dreams. We talked about um, MLK dream, and we also remembered another dream from Victor Hugo. 19th century France that was still trying to achieve uh, the ideals of liberty, egality, and fraternity. This year, one year later, I think it's important for us to reflect a little bit of what we have done in this first year of strategic plan implementation. And so I'd like to take an opportunity to highlight uh, some of the key areas. And I will start with the deans and the work that the deans within and across their colleges have been doing. And many of them have been able uh, to complete the launch of diversity, equity and inclusion committees within their colleges and schools. Some schools were already well ahead and some others have just started the, their journey uh, by working together and continuing to share best practices and, and lessons learned. Uh, during our Dean's councils and inviting various members of the community. So I applaud that work that is carried out together. And then we have the joint work of our Vice President for Student Services, Dr. Monica Burnett, and Dr. Jonathan Farina, leading one important goal of our strategic plan and the University Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee, 
that has been launching many new initiatives and helping learn, learning and development across the university. We also have the work of our human resources leaders, Mike Silvestro, and our chief diversity officer, Laurie Brown, who have been training in countless hours, um, search committees on the notion of implicit bias. And this training is very important now because, as you know, Seton Hall University is recruiting about 30 new faculty and mostly in tenure track line that we want to bring to our community next year. And so this is an incredible opportunity for us to continue to work on diversity, equity and inclusion and attract scholars and scholar teachers who have many different ideas, as it was discussed earlier um, by one of our guests that bring richness to the life of our community. And then under the leadership of Dr. Mary Balkan, who serves as the chair of the Faculty Senate, but also as director for the Center of Faculty Development, we have continued to hold a series of workshops and retreats on diversity, equity and inclusions, and those are extremely well attended. And the Faculty Senate, as we speak this year, is currently evaluating the integration of questions on diversity, equity and inclusion in our end of the semester teaching evaluation instruments, which is one of the goals of our strategic plan. And then last but not least, um, Mission and Ministry, under the direction of uh, Father Colin Kay, continues essential work on inclusions that is at the, heart, at the heart of the Catholic social teaching. So I'm pleased to see all these efforts across the entire university. And I cannot name everyone at this point, but I want to just note that the integration of efforts that we have seen in this past year speaks to that notion of one university that we discuss in our strategic plan. But it also shows that we already are one university. For example, last November, we were able, we were honored by the presence on campus of honorary degree recipient Brian Stevenson. He came to campus and he delivered a wonderful, wonderful acceptance speech to over 500 of us in person and online. And when he accepted his Laura, laurea honoris causa, his speech was phenomenal. And, and the question is, how did we get Brian Stevenson to accept yet another honorary title that he has so many? And that brings me back to the one university. His presence in our campus was the result, the result of the work of many of our community members, from Dr. Pritchett to the SHU Reading Committee, to the core program, to the School of Law and to all the faculty who read and taught Just Mercy in the classroom as the first year reading, and all the students who submitted wonderful essays based on this reading. And Brian Stevenson, when he came, he was truly delighted of accepting an honorary degree from Seton Hall. His genuine um, enthusiasm was palpable, and he was proud to become a new member of our community. And that shows not only what we have done, but also what we will continue to do in the future. And in fact, Dr. Pritchett updates me every week on the progress that he's making and work, working with the Equal Justice Initiative Foundation, uh, which is uh, Brian Stevenson Foundation in Montgomery, Alabama, and the King Center for Nonviolence in Atlanta. Uh, where he's planning to take our students, our MLK st scholars, at a time when it's safe to travel again. And Dr. Pritchett, I hope you will take many of the faculty and administrators with you in this travel. So I applaud you again for all of your work, all you're doing, and all of that you're continuing to do. And I look forward to listening to the discussion today. I believe that there is no better way for us to open to open a new semester. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cattarini. Pasarini. 
Um, and I hope everybody's having a, um, a joyful time this morning. Uh, you know, the weather outside is a, a bit gloomy and it's even interfering with our um, power. But um, I think Dr. King is looking down from heaven this morning, maybe with Mother Teresa. And I hope they're enjoying the program also. Um, throughout the decades that the MLK program has existed, uh, our scholars since the 1970s have been going into surrounding communities and uh, doing things like tutoring and setting up mentoring programs uh, for young people. And in the context of our community work, uh, we are always developing community partners. Uh, three of those partners will be sharing with us today uh, in the form of um, the New Jersey Orators. This is a group of, of um, volunteers throughout the state who help young people from um, uh, elementary school, middle school, and high school age uh, to develop their speaking capacities. Um, and in one uh, occasion, some of the young people will have even memorized some of the speeches of Dr. King. Uh, we'll also uh, have a develop a partnership with the premier dance company out of Montclair, New Jersey. Um, they have developed some very beautiful um, suites of, of, of uh, music and dance arrangements, which honor um, the civil rights period and many of the heroes and heroines from that period. But our first cultural presentation of the afternoon uh, this morning is going to be um, something rather unique and rather interesting. One of our community uh, partners happens to be a classically trained musician, Bree Block. And uh, Bree is uh, a native of North Carolina. She considers herself a hip hop violinist, a singer and a songwriter. She loves to create experiences that sets a good vibe uh, through her thought and her thought provoking uh, cultural performances. She's also known for literally seducing her audiences with the various harmonies and the bass lines that she's able to generate with what she calls her neo soul music. Her music centers around many different uh, types of dynamic relationships between society and between people. Um, she's been playing the violin for well over 13 years. Um, and at one point uh, when she was in college, she really became a little bit bored, as she shares with us, with uh, literally once she had mastered classical music. And she then began exploring other genres and fell in love with playing music that was really closest to her soul. Uh, she currently performs uh, throughout the tri-state area, and you might even see her in the subways of New York City. And today, believe me, um, she has prepared a real blessing for our soul. Everyone, I present to you Bree Block. Thank you.
Can you imagine us taking uh, Brie into elementary schools uh, with our MLK scholars and uh, introducing classical uh, music uh, and the violin stringed instruments to young people um, in such a creative way? Uh, we're so blessed to be in relationship with her. I'd like to give somewhat of an overview of what we'll be doing for the remainder of the day before I introduce. Uh, our next presenter. Um, we're going to be, um, we've asked a number of faculty to join us uh, covering all of the disciplines literally of the university. Uh, from uh, everything from education, the humanities, uh, the social sciences, um, psychological uh, studies, health sciences, and so forth. Um, and we're going to be utilizing a framework of what uh, many would call Catholic social justice. And um, we trust that this will be uh, enlightening for all of us. Uh, you know, Seton Hall University was founded in 1856. We have hundreds of years of uh, training servant leaders. And we believe that in the 21st century, our emphasis uh, upon the social justice momentum that we see all around the globe. Uh, our um, 
foundation for understanding is informed uh, by certain principles uh, within Catholic social teaching. So I'm going to share those um, ideas with you now rather simply. Number one, uh, Catholic social teaching will teach us about the dignity of every human being. We all may look alike or differently in, in, in terms of our uh, anatomical structures, but indeed, God has created us all to be like a beautiful uh, fountain and, um, and a beautiful garden. And we all be desperate to get used to being in that garden together. Um, next would be an emphasis upon family, community, and participation. Uh, better known sometimes as like democracy, but the root of all of our values comes from our nurturing and our family units. And by participating to make sure that all of our communities are fully functional. Another uh, value that is implicit in this training uh, in the Catholic value system is going to be understanding our rights and responsibilities. We all live together. We are all interconnected. We also have a, um, an obligation, uh, the Bible reminds us. It's called the option for the poor and those who are vulnerable, widows, children, um, the immigrants who come into a new land full of hope, only to meet, in too many cases, despair and, and hatred. Uh, this is totally and solely unbiblical. And we realize that we are a people of many different faiths. Uh, that's why we center in the very beginning of this program all of the major faith traditions, uh, so that we all understand that we can all communicate with one another if we all start by respecting one another. Another faith tradition uh, and that emphasizes the value will be the dignity of all work and the rights of workers. I believe that during uh, this period of, uh, of, of COVID, it's been revealed to many of us, for example, just how vulnerable certain people can be, particularly if they are involved in hourly employment, how difficult it is for them uh, to, it, when they take time off from work, they are actually losing wages. That is, take time off from work for the vaccinations, which are so essential. Um, even when their children are home from school, if they have to uh, provide for the, the care of those children during the day, uh, that may represent for many of these vulnerable homes a loss of income. Uh, so I think all of us have gotten our um, sensitivity around the issues of the rights of workers uh, somewhat heightened. Next value would be that of solidarity, that indeed we are mankind. I think Dr. King once said, if we all don't learn how to live together as brothers and sisters, we shall surely perish as fools. So we must all learn to live together, to work together, to love together, to make this planet a better place. Uh, the division that we have witnessed in America has not come from just the, the people alone. Unfortunately, some of our leaders have been very instrumental in, in uh, facilitating these forms of division. If we are going to be the moral example for the, for the entire globe at this point in time, we have to pray that God would allow us and show us how we need be, to become solidarity with one another. God creates children, and the Bible even reminds us that if adults don't take care of the business the way they should, uh, that God would raise up a child and a child shall lead them according to the scriptures. So the care for God's creation, uh, children and the earth, um, we have stewardship over that now. And it's time that we wake up and stay woke. It's now my pleasure to introduce of our first major academic presentations of the day, Dr. Kelly Harris. He is the current chair of Africana Studies at Seton Hall University. Uh, Dr. Harris brings with us um, a great tradition of commitment uh, to the scholarship and of empowering students to be all that they can be. He comes by way of Chicago, through Philadelphia, uh, through Clark Atlanta University, also in Atlanta. So it is now my esteemed pleasure to introduce to some or present to others, Dr. Kelly Harris, 
who will give us a, an overview of the civil rights movement. Dr. Harris, please. Thank you, Reverend Dr. Forrest Pritchett. Thank you, um, and Dr. Prasaro and the other organizers who organized this event and having me here today. Um, I'm excited to be here and be with you today. Um, good morning to the administrators, uh, my colleagues and students and friends of Seton Hall University. Uh, so let me begin. I, I want to begin actually by asking uh, everyone a question and please put your answer in the chat um, if you would. When did the civil rights movement begin? Oh, let me st first let me say this. So my I have to do two presentations today, and I'm breaking them in, into two. So there's one presentation that I'm it's in two parts. So my first question is, and please put your answer in the chat. When did the civil rights movement begin? When you think about the civil rights movement, what do you think about? What what do you think its beginnings as? Help me out. Don't be quiet. Just put it in the chat. Dean Roundy, after Emmett Till. Okay, so we're talking 19, 1954. And I hope you all are, are taking a look at uh, the Women in the Movement by ABC um, and about Emmett Till's mother. It's an excellent series. Uh, see, 1950s, all right? Dean said the open casket sparked it all, 1950s, early 1950s. So that's what we're getting, the early 1950s, all right? All right, well, well, thank you, 1880s. Alexander says the 1880s. Um, uh, uh, Anyanya says the 1950s, 1960s. Okay, very good. Thank you all uh, for putting those in there. And before I begin, too, I, I have to say, that performance by Bree was dynamite. <laughs> it was awesome. Uh, it reminds me of how much musical talent I don't have. So um, I, I need to check her out some more. So that was an excellent way to start our day. Uh, Linda says, definitely the modern civil rights movement, but there is a connection further back to slavery. That, indeed. Greensboro Forward was a big moment, 1960, Todd, uh, Dr. Stockdale. That's correct. All right, so here we go. So one of the things that I want to do today, um, I want to get into this and... Interestingly enough, on the eve of the March on Washington, which was 1963, on the eve of the March on Washington, there was a civil rights luminary uh, who died on the eve of the March on Washington. And that person gives, me, gives us a good example of really trying to understand the civil rights movement. And I talk about it in terms of a milieu. Uh, rather than a movement. Um, and we can get into that, uh, hopefully. Um, and pe please put your comments in in the chat while I'm going on. Maybe we had time to, for discussion. Maybe anything I can answer, um, I will do um, in part one and, and for part one and for part two. But W.E.B. Du Bois, who was born in 1868, he died on the eve of the March on Washington. And when they told uh, Dr. King and others that he passed, all they said, the old man uh, passed away. And that's why they referred to Dr. Dr. Du Bois as the old man, uh, because in many ways he was one of the um, founders of the modern civil rights movement. But it's interesting when we look at Du Bois. Du Bois, one of the things he's known for is his work, The Souls of Black Folk, which was published in 1903. And in that work, he had a famous quote. One of his famous quotes was, the problem of the 20th century will be the problem of the color line. Du Bois was reflecting on, of course, the white man's burden that was ravaging uh, the, the world uh, at that time. Uh, but there's the interesting chapter that Du Bois had in Souls of Black Folk. And it's a chapter on a man named Alexander Cromell. And that's where I kind of want to begin when we talk about these 19th century roots. And this is a picture of Alexander Cromell, born in 1819. But it was a mentor, died in, in, in 1897, was a mentor to W.E.B. Du Bois. Interesting thing about W.E.B. Du Bois and, and Alexander Cromell, Du Bois says it all starts with Cromell. There's a beautiful chapter on him in the souls of black folk. But interestingly enough, right now we're on, we're in, we're fighting for voting rights, to protect voting rights, particularly from the Voting Rights Act of 1965, trying to get passage of the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, trying to strengthen uh, uh, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, since it's being uh, assaulted uh, from many different uh, state uh, legislatures. 
right, and the Supreme Court. But interestingly enough, look at this. 1840, Alexander Cromwell drafted a petition to the New York legislature seeking removal of restrictions against Negroes on the right to vote. Think about that, right? Think about that. So almost uh, close, nearing 200 years ago, we're getting close, he was fighting, pushing for voting rights, securing voting rights, protecting voting rights, uh, free black folk in New York, right? But Cromel is, an, is, is interesting because Cromel was a part of a culture of young intellectuals who were inspired by this man, Peter Williams Jr., who was a pastor in New York. And his father was a pastor, all right? Well known. So Peter Williams gave an oration in the 1830s against the, uh, uh, during the 4th of J July, criticizing the United States about the 4th of July. And now I put that in here for one particular reason. One person who was seen as one of the, one of the grand people when we talk about discussing civil rights uh, in this country is Frederick Douglass. One of his most amazing speeches was, what to the slave is the 4th of July? But 20 years before that, this man gave a speech uh, which basically said, what to the slave is the 4th of July? But Peter Williams taught at this African free school in New York, and he mentored Alexander Cromwell, Henry Highland Garnett, James McCune Smith, and other black, uh, young black men who would become leaders in the 19th century, right? who will be fighting for those rights, for people's rights. But even before Peter Williams, from 1808 through the 1820s, beginning on January 1st, 1808, African-Americans celebrated the abolition of the slave trade. Because again, in the United States Constitution, it says the slave trade should be abolished in 1808. Now we know it wasn't, but the fact that it was supposed to, African-Americans had these celebrations. But during these celebrations, they would expose the hypocrisy between liberty and freedom uh, that we see extolled in the founding documents uh, of the framers of the Constitution, right? So they would, so they would challenge that. That would became a a thing that they would do, a tradition of black folk challenging it uh, on that. Another early precursor, an early important leader, James Fortin. Now I put this in here for a particular reason, because oftentimes when we think of the movement. Uh, we think of resistance to slavery. We think of slave revolts. Uh, we think of the Underground Railroad. But one of the things that we don't think about is the way that free blacks challenged the institution of slavery. That cha not only the institution of slavery, but challenged the laws and free states that would seek to limit the freedom of black folk, people of African descent. So here's an amazing thing. So James Fortin in 1813, published a pamphlet that challenged a proposed public policy in the state of Pennsylvania that would limit the freedom of uh, free blacks and that would limit the black migrants from entering the state of Pennsylvania. So he printed these letters challenging this policy. And in this, in this case, he won. The proposed policy that was going to be before the Senate in Pennsylvania did not go through, primarily because of these letters that James Fortin, a significant black, free black person in the city of Philadelphia, uh, because of his challenge that, that he did that. And the free blacks in Philadelphia, Richard Allen and others, uh, were very important. But we can't forget the women. The first woman, black, white, or otherwise, to speak before all male audiences was Mariah Stewart in 1829, 1830, 1831. Uh, she, she was a free black person in Boston. She was inspired by another black activist named David Walker, who some locate as one of the early founders of the civil rights struggle uh, uh, for black folk. David Walker wrote a, an appeal to the colored citizens of the world that was very radical for its time. But Mariah Stewart was a pioneer for women's rights, but she all will, also was advocating for civil rights uh, in her speeches uh, in the 1830s. And her stint was short-lived in the 1830s because, of course, she was a woman and being marginalized. But Mariah Stewart was groundbreaking in many ways. Then we have the Negro Convention Movement, which ran annually from 1831 to 1864. And I should say it was it was it was also 
by state, by state, by state. New York had a convention. New Jersey had a convention. Pennsylvania had a convention. Georgia, even though it was a slave state, had a convention. So you had these convention movements where black folk would come together and discuss what to do about the institution of slavery. Now, the question that we have to ask ourselves, what do we call it? Is it civil rights, right? So in the modern era, we think about civil rights movement as beginning, historically, people would say it began with Brown v. Board, or it began with the Montgomery bus boycott, or it began with the death of Emmett Till and the, and the, uh, 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 the movement that the, the activism that came after Emmett Till. You know, all those, are, th th those make sense. Some others will go back to the founding of the NAACP in 1909 and then the work that they were doing. Some others will go back to, this we'll see in a second, the, um, the Niagara movement in 1905. So there are a lot of different places. But the question that we have to ask ourselves, what do we call this in the 19th century? What do we call it when black people are standing up fighting for their rights, not only to abolish uh, slavery, but for their rights as citizens or supposed to be citizens in this country uh, for their exposing the hypocrisy in the founding documents? What do we call their activism? Do we call it the civil rights movement? Do we just, they, they're more than just abolitionists. So what do we call it? Um, so I, I would argue that this is a part of this milieu that was created in the 19th century uh, as a struggle for civil rights. And early another struggle, in uh, Roberts v. the city of Boston, 1850, here you see the second black lawyer in this country's history, Robert Morris, and Charles Sumner, uh, who was a diligent advocate uh, for civil rights. As a matter of fact, the first and second civil rights acts uh, were Charles Sumner was very instrumental in passing, Civil Rights Act of 1966, and the Civil Rights Act of 1875, which unfortunately was found unconstitutional by the civil rights cases of 1883. And let me pause there, because that's something very instructive for all of us to remember, and particularly for the students. The second Civil Rights Act in this country's history, the Civil Rights Act of 1875, ended discrimination in hotels, inns, restaurants, on trains, Right? It did the same thing that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 would have to do. Of course, the 19 Civil Rights Act of 1964 was a little bit more expansive, but essentially did the same thing that the Civil Rights Act of 1875 did. But what happened to the Civil Rights Act of 1875, because Reconstruction would end two years later with the Compromise of 1877, there was a backlash to black freedom. There was a backlash. People that said, we gave black people too much. They have too many rights. They're taking over the country. They're ruining the country. And the civil rights case of 1883, the, the Supreme Court said that the Civil Rights Act of 1875 was unconstitutional. And that really put the nail in the coffin for reconstruction. And not only that, it, put, it, it, it gave another uh, uh, inspiration to the backlash against uh, African Americans in this country, um, and calling them African Americans wouldn't even be correct because we weren't seen as citizens. Uh, so that is very instrumental and that we should remember. But going back to Sumner and Robert Morris. So Benjamin Roberts had a daughter who he was sending to school, um, to an to a, a integrated school. And his daughter, or he wanted his daughter to go to a, to a, to a school that was better than the school that was in his, his area. They said he can't do it. So they challenged it. This was the first challenge. This is before Brown v. Board. This is 100 years, 104 years before Brown versus the Board of Education. And as you see in this quote, Benjamin Roberts says of his work with Robert Morris, the cause of equal school privileges originated with us. Unaided and unbiased, we commenced the struggle. What struggle is he talking about? He's talking about that civil rights struggle. This is the 1850s, but he's talking about the civil rights struggle. Um, and this is the first time in the history of this country that the phrase equality before the law was used, that was translated into English. One of the, the first major black organization in this country was the National Afro-American League, 1890, founded by this man, T. Thomas Fortune, who argued presently that the civil rights struggle and the leadership of the league would, quote, exhaust the best intelligence of the race for the next century. 
He wasn't lying. And look at the very first thing on their six point program, the securing of voting rights. What do we call it? Do we call the National Afro-American League a part of the civil rights struggle, right? If it's not a part of the civil rights movement proper, it is a part of this milieu, uh, the civil rights milieu of black people and their allies fighting for civil rights. And of course, we cannot forget Ida B. Wells Barnett. Ida B. Wells started the anti-lynching uh, crusade um, even until well into the 1960s. Um, people were advocating for anti-lynching legislation uh, in the United States Congress. She started that movement. And anti-lynching was definitely a part of the civil rights struggle um, and what we call the civil rights movement. Broadly speaking, it was a part of the struggle for freedom in this country. Because as you all well know, lynching, going to Emmett Till, would be a part of the American landscape well into the 1950s, 1960s. Some would say even to, to today, when we look at George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, uh, Laquan McDonald, uh, and others. And then, we, of course, we have the National Association of Colored Women, the first black women's organization in this country, who were on the forefront for speaking for women and saying that no one else could speak for black women. White women couldn't do it. White men couldn't do it. Black men couldn't do it. Only black women could say where they uh, stand. And this one, this movement is very important, too, in terms of the struggle for civil rights, because even later, we have to grapple with how women were marginalized in the movement, even though really that they, they were at the forefront of the movement. That's something that we still have to grapple with. And historians, to their credit, are doing a great job now of, of, of giving voice to the struggle of black women uh, throughout this country's history. And finally, to end this first part of this presentation, uh, the Niagara Movement um, in 1905. And I'll just read briefly this quote. We will not be satisfied to take one jot or title less than our manhood rights. And again, that's gendered. We got to deal with that. We claim for ourselves every right that belongs to freeborn Americans, political, civic, and social. And until we get these rights, we will never cease to protest and assail the ears of America. And what did they focus on? Voting rights, ending discrimination in public accommodations, equal enforcement of the law, quality education. And one of the things that we have to consider, and that is instructive, is those same things that they fought for in 1905, we are still fighting for in 2022. Um, and that is a sad commentary uh, on what we face. So with that, I will stop uh, my presentation um, and look forward to questions and dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone that during uh, these presentations, uh, from faculty, uh, they will have 10 to 15 uh, minutes of the presentations, and then we are allowing about five minutes toward the end of each one for any Q and A. Um, so I want to thank Dr. Harris very much, and we look forward to his next presentation. Uh, now I'm going to take a look at. Um, The legacy of Dr. King. And I hope that I'll need some help from our uh, <clears throat> tech people just to give me the feedback. It's good, Forrest. I can see your presentation. Gotcha. Is it full screen and so forth? Yes, sir. Oh, excellent. Excellent. I appreciate the feedback. No worries. We're going to take a brief look at another side of Dr. King that many people probably uh, have taken a little bit for granted simply because we focus upon him in a one dimensional sense. We know he made a great speech and that he was assassinated at some point. Um, the fullness of today is to help make Dr. King more three-dimensional. Um, uh, King as a man, a family man, uh, King as the preacher, King as the civil rights activist, and King also as um, uh, the PhD from Boston University who produces and writes books as a part of his legacy. So with that in mind, hopefully when we push the right buttons, 
everything will go well. Here we have um, Dr. King's first book, uh, Stride Toward Freedom, uh, 1958. You will recall the um, civil rights movement um, that most people refer to, but in the context of Dr. Harris's presentation, we might want to rename it now the contemporary um, civil rights movement in the sense that there is a classical uh, period that Dr. Harris has outlined for all of us. Um, so in this first presentation, Stride Toward Freedom, you can see uh, I, I highlight a, a nugget uh, for everyone that uh, it deals with the circumstances uh, in Montgomery concerning the emergence of the bus boycott, which wasn't um, something that originally was planned for. It was simply um, the act of Rosa Parks, which caused uh, the community to come together in the evening at a church uh, to think about how they might um, assist and show support for Rosa when she went into court. I might pause there for a moment because maybe Dr. Harris might even uh, deal with this in his next presentation. But many of us know that prior to Rosa Parks, getting all the publicity around her sitting down, as we like to say, to say we all could stand up. We could talk about a young teenager, Claudette Colvin, who, uh, as a result of her own psychosocial development, which simply means, you know, as is, is when we become teenagers and you're an adolescent and you're looking to um, assert yourself. Well, Claudette uh, decided, uh, with no other support from any of the groups, to sit down on the bus as an act of really uh, teenage defiance. And as such, uh, local organizations such as the NAACP did not think that her circumstance and her situation would be the kind of case they wanted to carry forward uh, to spotlight and highlight um, sit-in activity. Uh, so that's just a precursor to the Rosa Parks of circumstance. But look at those numbers. 50,000 people took part in a boycott of the buses that lasted uh, literally um, uh, 52 weeks, one full year plus another two weeks. Um, that's a mighty long time for people to work together uh, to see to it that through their cooperation, um, buses would ultimately yield. And once the federal laws were, were written, uh, those buses were integrated. Dr. King's second book, 1963, really comes as a result, as it says there, um, from the letter from the Birmingham jail. I always like to remind uh, students and others about the miracle that that letter really was. You know, that um, Dr. King had initially no access to any paper at all while he was uh, confined in that uh, jail cell. And he used newspapers, uh, something we don't see too much anymore. But you know that normally around the margins of a newspaper, you'll have at least uh, an inch to an inch and a half of clear space where there's no print. Well, Dr. King used all of those margins uh, to pen a response. A number of uh, clergy had criticized uh, Dr. King um, for, um, in a sense, pushing it, uh, pushing it too much, too fast, too far. Uh, that group of clergy um, themselves were already involved with negotiating uh, in that local area to bring about changes before King came on the scene. They really wanted him to slow down and to say, wait, we can handle this. Uh, so Dr. King develops in this text his theological foundation for talking to other clergy, uh, that God does not cause for any of us to wait. When you have God on your side, you can move into the battlefield and assume your position for victory. 1963, Strength to Love, becomes uh, a volume that King had worked on for a very uh, long time because it was an, an accumulation of uh, sermons that really uh, his publishers wanted him to take time through discipline as a clergy person to put these uh, sermons, you know, into a volume. 
Um, so it took a lot of additional work because obviously King's time was really spent um, running uh, the Christian, Southern Christian Leadership Conference and planning all of those various campaigns with his staff. And um, so this became really a labor for him and it was a little bit tough for him to get it you know, uh, to the level where the publishers would be, uh, would be satisfied with their timetable. But indeed, it really takes a look at, in a sense, the kind of uh, religious values um, that informed everything that he thought, that he saw, and that he did. Um, and here, in this context, we can see almost a parallel with the type of work that is being done also at Seton Hall University. In that, in addition to academic um, and technical scientific training we're giving our students, uh, we also want them to leave our institution with a comprehensive set of values, which are clearly set in a Catholic social teaching. Where do we go from here? 1967, a good year for many people for different reasons. It was King's analysis here of the state of race relations and the movement um, one uh, decade into the movement. We think about 63 also with the, the March on Washington. Uh, we think about the bombing of the church uh, in Birmingham. Um, we think about different calls for different strategies, violence, nonviolence, uh, defending of oneself as guaranteed by the Constitution of the United States. Uh, but King sets forth the vision and the plan uh, for moving ahead. And the one last volume that I want to mention today um, actually is upon uh, King's death, uh, uh, Coretta Scott King, his soulmate, uh, wife, um, helped to bring uh, together um, some of the, the last items that he was working on and in June of 1968, two months after his assassination, The Trumpet of Conscience uh, was published. Uh, this sets a uh, unique vision, and this is one reason why uh, I wanted to um, highlight this for a moment. Among the many things that King does here, if you look carefully at my uh, commentary on the narrative, he envisions um, a new uh, front uh, emerging that would be involved with youth. He noticed how many um, young white uh, male and females were beginning to um, drop the values of, of their parents uh, and, of, if you would, of white culture. Uh, they were rejecting uh, that traditionalism, that conservatism, uh, the kind of bigotry that came with their sense of privilege. And he saw a coming together of many different youth groups and, um, and, and then an emphasis upon, if you would, human rights. And that's one of the uh, very um, powerful points that has been overlooked, I think, through history. And he thinks this new coalition of young people uh, will present a challenge uh, to those who uh, have power and not official power. Um, you know, the president of the United States has, if you would, constitutional power, the Senate and the Congress also. Uh, but he identifies here the people who have real power to even influence those politicians. And that power comes from and that privilege comes from their sense of race. And their control of space. Uh, so I'm going to um, stop uh, this uh, at this this point. And we're now going to have Dr. Uh, Kelly Harris come back with us and um, continue his presentation on the movement and its evolution. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you, uh, Reverend Dr. Pritchett. Um, and I wanna remind people, uh, particularly the students, you know, you are too quiet. Put stuff in the chat, put your comments in the chat, put questions in the chat, right? Um, Let's let's uh, let's try to have some dialogue. Uh, so hopefully I can run through this and, and leave time for uh, question and answer. Um, but at any rate, um, so we want to get to um, the human rights piece, and in the same way that the civil rights movement is part of a larger context, 
so is this human rights connection um, that Dr. King inherited. And one of the things that, that, that we want to be able to say is Dr. King was a dynamic individual, dynamic leader who stood on the shoulders of those who came before him and those who were with him. So we always had to remember the struggle is not just being one person, even as we celebrate that particular person. Um, sometimes we lose sight of that. So in, in, in 1920, the, the Universal Negro Improvement Association had an international convention, right, uh, in Madison Square Garden. Delegates from all over the world were there. And an interesting person was there as well. Ho Chi Minh was there at this convention in New York in 1920. Ho Chi Minh was inspired a little bit by the UNIA. And, not, and more importantly than the UNIA, he was inspired by the struggles of African Americans in this country, all right? Um, that same year, the International Council of Women of Darker Races was formed, uh, 1920. Um, some of the people you may, uh, these pictures are hard to see. I don't know if you all can make these people out, but so I generally would ask if anybody notices anyone in the picture, uh, but rather than do that, I'll just name probably three of the most recognizable people. And the one in the back in the middle is Mary Church Terrell, who was the founder of the National Association of Colored Women. In front of her right here where my cursor is, that's Mary McLeod Bethune. And next to her is Margaret Murray Washington, Booker T. Washington's second wife. But these women um, wanted to broaden the discussion. Um, they wanted to uh, focus on colonialism, but also broaden the perspective on race, gender, politics, and activism. Uh, very important uh, council at that time. The National Negro Congress, 1935. Why is this important for human rights? because they were trying to develop a unified workers movement which of black and white workers, which is a theme that Dr. King would pick up on. One of the things about Dr. King, and, and Dr. Pritchett mentioned it correctly uh, in, his, in his presentation, all labor has dignity. Dr. King would repeat that often. Um, and there's an excellent volume called All Labor Has Dignity, if anyone wants to see the speeches that Dr. King gave to labor groups, um, many speeches. Um, that people don't uh, uh, remember at, at times. Um, also, if you recall, the 1963 March on Washington was sponsored, was in, was in coordination with labor unions, right? It was a march for freedoms, jobs, and justice. Freedoms, jobs, and justice, right? And of course, we get the beginnings of that March on Washington movement in 1941, A. Philip Randolph, would be the leader of the the leader of uh, the movement, or I should say, the spokesperson of the movement. And this really, two people saw as being a part of what we call the double V campaign: victory abroad and victory at home, victory against Adolf Hitler and Mussolini, and victory at home uh, against the racism and segregation and Jim Crow in this country. The Council on African Affairs. All right. Again, one of the things when we talk about the civil rights. This is running. This is running simultaneously. Uh, what we call the civil rights movement, what has been called the civil rights movement. All right. So there was never one track. African Americans were always focused not only on what was happening locally, but were also what was happening globally, particularly with the anti-colonial struggles in Africa and other places. I, and I, I should pause here and, and say another thing that I should have really put in the presentation. So even during the 19 teens and 1920s and 1930s, you see black people traveling to India because black folk were so inspired by Gandhi and the struggle for Indian independence, right? We see them doing that often. Matter of fact, one of Dr. King's uh, mentors, Howard Thurman, who was one of the more brilliant uh, theologians in the early part of the 20th century. He went and met with uh, Gandhi, and he would tell that story about how he met with Gandhi and how that inspired him in terms of nonviolent direct action, which Dr. King, of course, would take, which Dr. King would even learn about from Bayard Rustin. Bayard Rustin was a gay black man who was marginalized because of his homosexuality. But Bayard Rustin is the one who really mentored Dr. King in nonviolent direct action. And Bayard Rustin had studied under what the under the Indian movement, what they had did. So that's very instructive. So we have to we also have to pay attention to that. 
Now, in the chat, just answer. I'm not able to see the chat while I'm doing this presentation. In the chat, though, please name these people. I'm curious if, if you can name these people in this chat. And Dr. Pritchard, you cannot answer. You cannot put any answer in the chat, Dr. Pritchard. Um, so, but name these people in this chat. But here's what's interesting, where these people are. And you can also try to guess where they are. This is 1945. This is, at, this is at the United Nations, founding of the United Nations, 1945. And you had black folk pushing the United Nations around issues of human rights. In 1944, uh, uh, the woman in the middle, Mary McLeod Bethune, had sponsored a meeting to deal with pushing for, you know, this deals with this founding conference. Everybody was talking about uh, the end of World War II and the beginning of a United Nations. Black people were saying, well, we want to make sure that that United Nations focuses on human rights. And you get a declaration of human rights from the UN in 1948. So I don't know whether you all put it in the chat or not, but I'll let you off the hook if, in case you didn't. The person to the left is W.E.B. Du Bois. In the middle is Mary McLeod Bethune. And to his right is, to her right, is Walter White. Walter White was the head of the NAACP at the time. All three were part of the NAACP at the time. Uh, during that same time, the National Negro Congress, you see the man Max Jurgen in the, in, to the, to the right, handing, with, holding the paper to the right. Uh, NAC leaders deliver a petition protesting discrimination to the United States to UN officials. And this would become a thing that black folk would do over and over again um, once the United Nations is formed. We see the United Nations as an ally in the struggle for civil and human rights and as a location to be used in the struggle for civil rights in this country. NAACP again submits an appeal to the world to the United Nations requesting domestic intervention uh, from the United States uh, against the United States, right? W.E.B. Du Bois was the one who, again, again, he's a giant who we don't re really, uh, who's underrated, as impossible as that may seem, who's really underrated. Um, as brilliant as he was, he's still underrated in the things that he did. June 13th, 1964. Now, why do I put this here? Well, I put this here for a few reasons. I always put this in presentations. I talk about Dr. King and Malcolm X. But in this particular one, this has uh, this is particularly uh, uh, deals with Sidney Poitier pass just uh, recently. Here you see at the bottom of the picture Sidney Poitier. What does this have to do with Sidney Poitier? That's Sidney Poitier and his wife Juanita Poitier, now Juanita Hardy. They hosted, and she would really host it, hosted at their home. They would often host discussions among civil rights leaders. On a January, June 13th, 1964, the Portiers invited Malcolm X to the discussion. Malcolm X had, earlier that year had left the Nation of Islam. Malcolm X was making overtures to civil rights leaders. So they invited Dr. King as well. Dr. King didn't show up, but the man you see in the picture standing over Dr. King, that's Clarence Jones. He was a lawyer. He also was the head of the Amsterdam newspaper. Uh, he was a good friend and colleague of Dr. King. Doc Clarence Jones was at the meeting. Ozzie Davis and Ruby D, who you see to the top left was there. The woman here, you see there, some of you may not know who that is. That's Lorraine Hansberry, she was there. And all these other civil rights leaders were invited. Many of them did not show they thought it was too radical to be there in the same room with Malcolm X. But at this meeting, Malcolm X threw out the idea that he wanted to organize with uh, African countries to charge the United States with human rights violations. That was his goal. That was his major program that he was working on at the end of his life. The FBI recorded this meeting. The FBI said in part of their COINTELPRO documents, counterintelligence program, the FBI said that was the most dangerous idea that came out of that meeting. Because what happened was Clarence Jones went back and told Dr. King, and Dr. King was willing to work with Malcolm X around the issue of human rights. Dr. King was going to organize black folk in the South. Malcolm X was supposed to organize black people in the North around this issue of human rights, all right? So that was a very key uh, critical meeting. 
And we received Dr. King at his death, and, and, and Dr. Pritchett really touched on this. Uh, his agenda really was continuing the voting rights, uh, anti-war is a human rights issue. And that's how he talked about the war in Vietnam. He said it was a human rights issue, not just uh, uh, and that, why he was concerned about it. Uh, of course, he was organizing the Poor People's Movement, uh, which is still going on today. And he was interested in con connecting the struggles of labor to the civil rights struggle. Um, and this quote that we should be mindful of from Dr. King, and there's so many that we can put in here that the media often doesn't show. Why is the issue of equality still so far from solution in America? A nation that process, professes itself to be democratic, inventive, hospitable to new ideas, rich, productive, and awesomely powerful. Dr. King asked, the problem is so tenacious because despite its virtues and attributes, America is deeply racist and its democracy is flawed both economically and socially. All too many Americans believe justice will unfold painlessly or that its absence for black people will be tolerated tranquilly. And that, my friends, is something that we have to remember. Dr. King saw this particular struggle uh, as the civil rights struggle as a part, part and parcel of a human rights struggle. And in that, he shared a lot um, with his contemporaries. And from that, I will look and see if there are any questions or comments in the chat. Dean said, was this in Switzerland? Somebody said, Mantasa Ahmad said, W.E.B. Du Bois, right? All right. Somebody said, Nancy Enright says, check out Mary McLeod Bethune's writing. She's absolutely right on that, right? Sherry says she used this paper, quote in the paper. Thank you. All right. Any other questions or comments before I go? All right, thank you. I hope I um, uh, did my job uh, sufficiently, uh, Dr. Pritchett, and I will look forward to the rest of the presentations. Oh, Dean asked a question, did black leaders ever visit uh, Vietnam? Mm, well, black soldiers <laughs> but, uh, during that time, black soldiers, uh, but no, uh, as far as I'm aware, Dr. Harris, Dr. King and others did not. Uh, travel to uh, Vietnam, not not when the uh, war uh, was raging, uh, not like they did in India. All right. Thank you all very much, and I look forward to the rest of the One second. Thank you. We had a little technical glitch. You there, Dr. Forrest, Dr. Pritchett? Right here. I don't think I'm spotlighted yet. I was looking for um, some more questions were coming in. I think you are spotlighted. Oh, OK, um, thank you. <laughs> My screen did not indicate that. That's uh, I appreciate it very much. OK, um, I'm going to. Um, Take a look now at Dr. King's. I, I noticed some. I was trying to read the the chat also as. Uh, oh, okay. Well, maybe up. we should answer a few Say, questions, uh, Rev. Yeah, please do. Please do it. Yeah. They still flow in. Okay. So, uh, Terrence asks, how, as we continue to move forward, how do we combat the growing tide against critical race theory being taught? Um, so, you know, it's interesting that you say that, ask that question, um, because what many teachers will say a lot of in, in high schools and of course in middle schools and elementary schools is not being taught. So people are mischaracterizing what's actually being taught. Um, and that's that's very important, too, because even in New Jersey, we're pushing um, to have the Amistad legislation correctly implemented um, and the teaching of African-American history, integrating it. Um, and with American history. And some people are calling that critical race theory. Um, some of the, the people we talk about today, um, you won't find W.E.B. Du Bois really talked about um, in K through 12 um, and the work that he did. We can mention Paul Robeson and others, Bayard Rustin and others, even, even the, the critical king uh, that we've seen today, you won't see taught 
um, in K through 12, and some people look at that as critical race theory. Um, so critical race it really isn't being taught. Uh, critical race theory is something that developed in law school um, that was developed by, um, I'm losing my, Lori Brown can chime in, I'm losing, I'm, I'm having a brain uh, uh, fart. Uh, Dave, uh, uh, Derek Bell. Uh, from Derek from Harvard Bell. University Law. Yeah. Harvard University. Derek Bell introduced really critical race theory. And of course, it's expanded by now. But that's where you find critical race theory being taught. But one of the things I think that people should do is be clear about what critical race theory is and what is actually being taught um, in K through 12. Um, because what's happening in America now, people just lie and people run with it. And, and that lie becomes the truth um, for a lot of people um, who really don't uh, do the research or get their information from limited sources. Uh, people are just lying about what's being taught. And, and Lori Brown put in there, Derek Bell, great book, and We Are Not Saved. Um, that is a great book for 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 people to look at um, and, and to to understand what Derek Bell argued for. And Derek Bell is a fun fact, he was a law professor at Harvard uh, when Barack Obama was there. Um, and I do believe Obama may have taken a class with uh, Derek Bell. Um, and when they were trying to discredit Barack Obama for a whole host of reasons, one of the things that they tried to link him to was Derek Bell. And Derek Bell is what they call radicalism um, for teaching critical race theory. So this isn't, this isn't a new thing. Um, it's new in terms of how, how, what kind of legs it has, um, but it's not a new thing. Um, matter of fact, as another side, as, as we wait to move on to the next, there's another, as an aside, Derek Bell resigned from Harvard. He was a tenured professor in Harvard Law School. He resigned over their lack of hiring and treatment of women, particularly black women at Harvard as a form of protest. Um, Derek Bell did that. Um, so that's another uh, a thing that we should keep in mind. Um, some of the sacrifices people make uh, every day uh, in their life. Any other questions or comments as we wait? Uh, Edwin, what do you think about schools teaching Black history only during Black History Month? That's a that's always been a that's always been a problem. And let me remind let me remind people what Carter G. Woodson uh, said at the founding of Negro History Week. Carter G. Woodson said, we are coming together this week to celebrate the things that we have studied all year long. And that's what, that's what we always had to remember about Carter G. Woodson. Negro History Week, which is now Black History Month, was intended to be a celebration of what they studied the whole year, not for taking a week or a month uh, to study things. But one of the challenges that I think all schools, many schools have, is that a lot of people graduate college, a lot of educators graduate college without having the proper tools to be able to teach African-American history. Uh, still to that, to this day, it's a challenge. So we really have to get uh, uh, educators, who people who major in education, taking more African-American history and of course, African-American studies classes. Um, so they have the tools to be able to teach it along with American history and world history. All right. Um, let's see, let's see. Uh, growing interest in African American history. Yes, uh, there is a growing interest. You know, critical race theory. One of the things um, that it shows is that we can't just analyze the country just from the lens of of race. That race intersects um, with class, with gender, and now we can even add you know, when people are talking about it with the environment. That, that, um, that there's a critical way of examining race in this country, that it's not simply a biological construct, um, that it is a social construct, um, and that we have to identify the other issues that intersect with it. Um, and that's where you get this intersectionality. Kimberly Crenshaw Williams, who is a leading critical race theorist now, um, she's the one who popularized the term intersectionality, um, but that's all a part of critical race theory. Um, and, it, and it's a good uh, uh, proponent of it. Um, Sherry says, Sharit says it should be a requirement for all educators around the world. 
right? We should at least have an honest dialogue about critical race theory. And it's hard to get an honest dialogue uh, today. All right, if there are no more questions, and if uh, Reverend Dr. Pritchett, I can turn it back to you. We still having technical difficulty. No, I got it. Had to unmute okay. myself, but um, I really, really enjoyed um, all of the interaction that was going on. This really makes for a, uh, um, I think, lively, interactive, and uh, in, in a virtual world, it's uh, so important. And I'm so glad to see a number of our faculty uh, members um, here, and all of you also from the external community. Uh, welcome to Seton Hall, your new home for the day. Um, we're now going to take a, um, a look at uh, Dr. King's leadership legacy, hopefully. So I'll just need, uh, once again, guidance from our uh, gurus. As, uh, let's see. Where is my leadership? The mic we're going to have to. Is that a, is my leadership presentation? Not yet that I see. And OK, let's so let's. Oh boy. Maybe easiest to share your screen. Hold on. Yep. We were going to a blackout and um, a weak power system a little bit earlier. Let's try it from. So I'm going to do one more click, let you know if that does it. No, I don't see it yet. Appreciate everyone's patience this process. They've all used teams. <laughs> they know what you're <laughs> going through. <laughs> all right, let's try this. Where did it disappear to? So Mike, is there any alternate way we could do something? You can certainly send us your slides and we'll share them for you. Uh, if you want to okay. send just a quick email, you know, we have the, uh, we can bump the order and go to the MLK Speaks video if you want to show that really quick and then come back. No, I think I, uh, Wanted that to be the highlight of the um, to close out our session. But yeah, let me see if I can just shoot this over to you. Certainly. We appreciate everyone's patience.
this is a great puzzlement. But Mike, maybe we will just go ahead and run the um, the, uh, the young people. Hold on, let me see one other way I could move my presentations around. I'm going to move to, let's try this. I'll move my presentations around a little bit. That is the quotable MLK I see right now. Yeah, and we'll substitute. Fantastic. OK. All right, folks, so I thought we would um, just focus upon some of the core ideas that will be coming across today and um, how Dr. King would or has already said uh, something concerning those components. Everything from um, American policy toward the indigenous people, law, health issues, how we relate to one another, even implications for our workplace, and uh, the kind of tools we need beyond your majors and disciplines, the kind of tools you need to survive in, in today's world. And that doesn't work. Okay, here we go. On the issue of, um, I say, greatness and leadership, not many of us ever probably aspired uh, right out the gate to be great, but ultimately 20 or 30 years uh, out into the professional world, um, we begin to make a mark. As a matter of fact, uh, the way we train leaders at Seton Hall University, we give you skills in the present, uh, but then we ask you to visualize what impact your life may make. Um, and in the final analysis, uh, when you are no longer with us, which seems like a gruesome thought, but what will people be saying about you? Uh, what will have been your impact? Who will you have influenced? How will the space that you have been in, how will it be different? And um, so here are some words from Dr. King. Everybody can be great because everybody and anybody can serve. So he is using that theological um, leader uh, paradigm of servant leader uh, to influence us. Uh, not about the accumulation of just wealth, uh, nor the toys of life and material objects and goods, uh, nor how much you advance yourself, but in the service that you give. You know, that's rather interesting because if uh, you ever study the indigenous peoples of North America, commonly called by many uh, American Indians, one of the um, rituals we can observe is called the potlatch. Uh, and this is where when you visit uh, one's village, and um, rather than you simply, uh, from the Western tradition, giving your host something, uh, one of the traditions of the indigenous people would be that they would give you, their guest, something, uh, like a gift, like a blanket, so that one's status and one's prestige is measured by the amount you give away, not by the amount you accumulate. So think about that for a moment and meditate upon it if you would. The Western world, the traditional and indigenous world, sets of values. We think we're more modern, more advanced, and more sophisticated. But think about the principle of giving versus receiving. He goes on to say, you don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. On the roots of oppression, here, I hope everyone can, can see that clearly. Here, Dr. King is reminding us about uh, the North American continent um, and the impact of the colonization of this landmass, that there were millions of people here before anyone else arrived, before the Spanish and before the English. 
and the Spanish began to arrive here in the early 1520s. But he's indicating that indeed, um, there were many things that were done in the name of building the American empire. It didn't start right away with the first meeting of the uh, people who were immigrating here. Uh, but after um, a century or two of, of, of immigration and development of the um, colonization of the landmass, uh, these, these indigenous people were set up for extermination. And we would also hope that in the coming months, the year 2022, as we move into Indigenous Peoples Month, which will be November, uh, we'll be able to explore some of these topics a little bit more in depth. Here he reminds us of something most interesting. While most of the world would agree that probably the things that Hitler did and under his leadership uh, with the National Socialist Party in Eastern Europe may have been considered egregious and, and uh, we shall never forget those things. King reminds us that everything that was done there was actually legal. How the political structure was used to manipulate the uh, perceptions of public policy, to have very deliberate policies of propaganda. Um, it's much like in today's world. About one year ago, we watched um, thousands of people run up the steps of the Capitol. Some people tried to say that those were simply enthusiastic terror, uh, tourists. Another said that these were focused terrorists. <laughs> so what is the truth? We know the truth. That's why teaching critical thinking skills is so important. We all must learn to think for ourselves. And unfortunately, I think the level of comfort in this country is so um, so high that many people have really just fallen asleep. They have been intoxicated with all the little toys they can play with. And I see someone had mentioned it also in the chat, indeed. Many people would be totally shocked if they really understood if you read Hitler's works and and follow the policy trail. Everything they did in Germany that is considered legal, they modeled after the United States of America. For example, uh, did you know that in California there was an official policy of, of, um, of um, sterilization of people who were considered um, somewhat feeble-minded, which meant that they did not operate, their mental capacity was not defined as being at the normal level. You could look at students who look at the eugenics movement and who the perpetrators of that were and what those policies were. We even uh, can see a residual of that over the last several decades in states like North Carolina, uh, where they passed a policy that indicated that if a woman who was on welfare uh, and perhaps not married uh, was in the hospital delivering her second child while still on welfare. And the state of North Carolina had a policy that they could, even without that woman's written consent, uh, they could sterilize those women while they were giving birth. And when I said written consent and understanding, many women uh, uh, in North Carolina who had never benefited from uh, being in school, learning how to read and write, Many of them could only put an X on a piece of paper and you had to read what was on the paper for them. Once again, this residual of, um, of the racism that was dominated the South is something that we all need to understand. Once those systems were in operation, uh, in many cases, eight to 10 generations of uh, families were impacted by that. A generation is defined as a 30 year period. Moving on to the next quote, a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching their spiritual doom. He indicates that we are bankrupting ourselves based upon our values, not necessarily the, uh, the monies in our bank accounts. So I would call that to everyone's attention. 
let us build credit in our moral values. On the new racism of the 21st century, King reminds us, don't be impacted by hate. Don't allow yourself to become hateful of those who hate you, who will kill you. These can be very difficult times for many. When we see people being shot down in the streets and justice not prevailing. <clears throat> Although one or two recent cases have given us hope. This is far from being a trend. He also reminds us of the role of hatred. Hatred can paralyze people, but your love can release it. Hatred uh, confuses life, but love can harmonize it. Hatred darkens life, but love can illuminate it. Later today, we're going to be hearing Dr. Mott talk about privilege. So um, think about how privilege is used to give more rights to certain people and deny rights to others. King calls that to our attention. Also, I would m remind some people who who may have access to more privilege than others, you have choices to make in life. Dr. King points this out very clearly. Every man, woman, and perhaps child must decide whether they will walk in the light of creative altruism. That is, um, how can you be of assistance to others? How can everything you do be of benefit to the community? or in the darkness of destructive selfishness. Later today, we will also hear from um, the chairman of the communications department, Dr. Radwan, who will be talking about uh, communications along with Todd Stockdale. So King reminds us, in the end, we will not remember the words of our enemies, but the silence silence of our friends. We all have to learn how to raise our voice, raise our voices together. Whether we are making demands or whether we are saying stop, enough is enough. People who fail to get along, according to Dr. King, because they fear each other. They fear each other. Why? Because they don't know each other. They don't know each other because they have not communicated well with each other. Please think upon that. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. If there is no justice, there can be no peace. He reminded us that as my sufferings mounted, I soon realized that there were two ways in which I could respond to my own situation, either to react with bitterness or to seek uh, to transform the suffering and to turn it into a creative force. I decided to follow the latter. And these are his comments on the areas of looking at civic engagement, confrontation, and the resolutions of conflict. Of conflict. In terms of workplace, every day we carry our skills into the workplace. But the first thing we carry into the workplace is our humanness. We should never really totally define our identity by the work that we do. But the work that we do should be informed by the nature of who we are as a human being. How do we feel? How do we love? How do we see? How do we want to be remembered? So he reminds us that as a result of the process of schooling and education, that intelligence plus character development is really the true goal of education, character development. Another author has defined character as what we do in the dark. Meaning, if you think no one can see you, 
is your behavior likely to change? Or would you be consistent in that darkness? In terms of your diversity toolbox, and now we're not literally talking about a box that you would carry around and hold by the handle, but we're saying, what are the skills that you must possess? Maybe um, as the great philosopher uh, Bertrand Russell uh, might have phrased it, we are what we think. So that first quote, when I look at it, coming from Dr. King, I, the way I'm going to translate this is, if indeed there are forms of oppression uh, in the workplace that may be caused um, and focused upon race or sex or ableism or religion, not one of us is going to be free until we all are free from those forms of oppression. And Dr. King's mighty admonishment to us all is free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are all free at last. So let's all work together to relift those burdens from all of us. Darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. Ultimately in life, we are but flesh and bone, uh, but spirit informs uh, the physical. What should it profit any person, for example, that we would you know, gain the entire world but lose our soul in the process? So Dr. King reminds the nation, not only will we have to repent for the sins of bad people, but we also have to repent for the appalling silence of the good people. We must come to see uh, that the end that we seek is a society at peace with itself. There's nothing more disturbing and how clear it is today. To see that so many people uh, become now threatened as their sense, their socially constructed sense of reality uh, begins to crumble, begins to be challenged all around them, particularly around the issue of whiteness, perhaps, something that we don't talk about enough. But he admonishes us, a society that can live with its conscience. We have a lot of good work to do, good soul work. And as my good friend John Lewis would have said, we all need to be getting into good trouble. Thank you all very much. We're going to check our agenda at this point. See where we are, and I have a feeling that I'm going to ask uh, Mike if at this point, um, I, let me see if I can pull up my, very briefly, the Saints and Social Justice piece. That looks very difficult. So, Mike, I'm going to ask us now if we can, we're going to prepare for our um, uh, the interlude before the break. And we're going to go ahead and uh, show our piece on the student voices. So we're now we're going to be looking at the work of the New Jersey orators. And Hello. we will My name is Eloise Samuels and I am the founder and CEO of the New Jersey orators. We are a 501c nonprofit youth organization that teaches the art of public speaking and appreciation for literature, reading and media arts literacy, civic engagement, and college readiness skills to youth from seven to 18 years of age. As various organizations across the state come together to celebrate Black History Month, we first would like to take some time out to commemorate Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King for all that he has done for us. So we are providing this tribute. 
Hello, I am Coach Janet Amankwa, the lead coach of the Plainfield Chapter of New Jersey Orators Incorporated. We at New Jersey Orators strive to fulfill the dream that Dr. King dreamed for all of our members. By teaching young people to use their voices, we encourage them to speak up and speak out about injustice and social change. Hello, I am Coach Chalk of the Plainfield Chapter of the New Jersey Orators. This year, members of the Plainfield and Somerset Chapters pondered the question, what would Dr. King's dream be today if he were here with us today? We will let our orators from the Plainfield and Somerset Chapters tell you what they think Dr. King's words mean to them and what his dream would be for all of us today. My name is Toa Ogomethan, and I'm a proud member of the Plainfield chapter of the New Jersey Arters. I believe today Dr. King would dream that we should all be a positive example for others to follow. Hello, my name is Jaina Abhansa, and I am a, optimist, a highly optimistic member of the Somerset chapter of New Jersey Orders. I believe today, Dr. King would dream that we should constantly improve, never stop learning, teaching, and leading the way. Hello, my name is Sohan Patel, and I am a proud member of the Somerset chapter of the New Jersey Oratory. I believe today, Dr. King would dream that we all know we are an important part of the future of this nation. Hello, my name is Walter Young III, and I am a highly motivated member of the Plainville chapter of the New Jersey Orators. I believe today, Dr. King would dream that we as a people would know that although on occasion, loneliness will come, we are never really alone, as long as we support and love one another. My name is Vishnu Samasetti, and I'm a proud member of the Plainfield chapter of the New Jersey Oratories. I believe today Dr. King would dream that we could keep a sense of pride in our culture and who we are, and respect for each other which gives a sense of pride to everyone. Hello, my name is Kara Jones, and I'm an exceptional member of the Plainfield chapter of the New Jersey Oratories. I believe today, Dr. King would dream of the heroes who came before him and would see all of us as the heroes of tomorrow, who will be a part of the grateful memories of future generations that will one day follow in our future. Hello, my name is Joseph Amponsa, and I am a dedicated member of the Somerset Chapter of New Jersey Order. I believe today, Dr. King would dream that we should try our best at all times and never set up. Okay, Forrest, it looks like you're sharing your slides now. Would you like to continue this and we can? Hello, my name is Please. Chelsea Young, and I am a courageous member of the Plainfield chapter of New Jersey Orchards. And I believe that today, Dr. King would dream above all else, that his people continue to have the courage to fulfill his dreams of the past and follow through on those dreams well into the future. Thank you from all of us from the New Jersey Orchards. everyone from my hometown, Plainfield, New Jersey. My name is Chelsea Young, and I am a proud student from Plainfield High School, home of the Mighty Cardinals. I am here today at the wonderful Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial at Washington, D.C.
Each year, Plainfield Public Schools and the Plainfield community celebrates Black History Month and the historic contributions of African Americans to society. Although there will be lots of celebration, no celebration will be quite complete without mentioning this awesome memorial erected in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The effort to establish the memorial was initiated in the 1980s by Alpha Phi Alpha, a historically black fraternity. In 1996, President Bill Clinton signed the congressional legislation authorizing the establishment of the memorial. The memorial has a wall along its circumference that displays some of Dr. King's most inspirational words. For example, here are his famous words. We must come to see that the end we seek is a society at peace with itself, a society that can live with its conscience. Each year, an average of 2 million people from all around the world visit this magnificent memorial at the heart of our nation's capital in Washington, D.C. Being here is such a wonderful opportunity to reconnect with a giant of the past who has done so much not just for the Black community, but for all of humanity. We want to thank the uh, New Jersey orators for sharing with us uh, what the future uh, looks like through those young people. Um, we in the MLK program, um, under normal circumstances, have had the uh, orators on our campus. We have provided them with a college readiness program and other motivational and career oriented workshops. Uh, we always look forward to the collaboration you know, with them. We know that the uh, the world of oratory is in great hands um, with those orators. So through the magic of digital media, I am back. And let's see how we do this time. Mike, are, are my slides uh, accessible to you? I'm not too sure. It's not on my screen right now. Not yet. <laughs> oh, wow. I wonder what happened to it. Try sharing one more time. Yep, we'll, we'll do our best. I apologize to everyone. The um, having some, I think, voltage fluctuations on this end. I'm not too sure if this is the way that needs to be, Mike, but let's give me some idea. There it is. Looks good. Thank you, Mike, so much. You're welcome, sir. OK. Um, so for everybody, I'm going to now. Um, share with you uh, the research of a um, another uh, a journalist who was Catholic, who took the earlier framework from um, social Catholic social teaching and went through Catholic history uh, to identify um, those individuals um, 
who have been sainted by the church um, uh, throughout various periods of time um, to enlighten us in the present. So this is going to be rather self-explanatory. Please turn your attention to um, the items that you will see on the screen. Brandon was the uh, the author of the material of the same name as the, uh, the presentation. Uh, so we'll be looking at those seven principles once again. So under the, um, the dignity of respecting all of the uh, human persons. You know, many people know of the success of Mother Teresa uh, in her ministry, uh, but many people do not know of the struggle it took single-handedly for her to really get that ministry from going from a vision to its implementation. Um, how there was even resistance from the church, uh, but many, many years of struggle and faithfulness on her part uh, yielded the um, um, Sisters of Charity. Um, so I've just had another this thought going through my mind that uh, you know one thing that Mother Teresa once said to us is that. God does not call us to be successful, but he calls us all to be faithful to him. That was very much exemplified by her work. St. Peter Claver. is also known as the patron saint uh, for slaves. Um, about a month ago, I had the honor of traveling into Montclair, New Jersey to St. Peter Claver um, Roman Catholic Church to celebrate their 90th anniversary. And uh, I'll be looking forward um, on behalf of, I think, working with the core program um, and maybe the Center for Community Education and, and, re and Engagement. Um, some work in which we may be able to take our students from Journey of Transformation, you know, off campus and um, uh, to have them looking at some of these historical places and to worship uh, with the congregations. Uh, we will be looking forward to going into St. Peter Claver. Our call to family, community and participation. St. Francis of Rome, please. Um, Pull your attention. When we see references to Job, and that's not job, um, we know that somebody is probably at their rock bottom of their human existence, meaning that they are laying literally flat on their backs, only looking up. They may have no hope left in life. And as Job was admonished to do, just curse God and die. But we know that sometimes life can put many people into a situation, not of their own choosing, in which they have been either oppressed and they have absolutely no hope for the future and that uh, death is perhaps a more clear alternative uh, than continuing to live. Moving on. The first woman missionary in the 18th century. Moving into the third area of our rights and responsibilities as conducted through a, um, a the lens, if you would, of the Catholic social teachings. Imagine how much tenacity it takes for one as we see here, to promote equality among the native population. Uh, you know, that be can, can become very, very, very difficult. Uh, 
sounds almost like the one of the priests who accompanied Columbus on Columbus's many voyages into the New World. Um, Bartholomew de la Casas. It is through his journals uh, that we understand the other side of Columbus's excursions. By the other side, I mean the, the side that most people are familiar with is that glamorized side of the that talks about the hero who comes into a space and discovers the Indians and brings civilization. De La Casas in his journals also speaks about um, the violations of the people that took place, the mutilations of the people, uh, the sexual exploitation of the females, uh, the germs uh, that were carried in, you know, by the, um, the Europeaners. Um, devastated that uh, native population. So the work of these two men uh, somewhat and their motivation and their um, their visions somewhat paralleled. St. Thomas More. The age of 12, how many how many of us could would be prepared to leave home to start our vocational lives? You know, the most the average student in America is leaving home to go to college at the age of 17 and 18. Martin Luther King entered college at the age of 15. Look down at the lesson that we can extract from St. Thomas More. As the author points out, he learned that defying authority would bring, you know, probably severe consequences. But often doing the right thing was the best thing to do. Dr. King also reminds us that the time is always right to do that which is right. The fourth teaching, the option for the poor and for the vulnerable. For those who help the widowed and the poor, we bring the sunlight into otherwise darkened spaces. The blessed be those who would serve. How much courage does it take for one who is born into a um, certain sense of privilege and socioeconomic security in life? who can hang out with all the right people as a result of his aristocratic uh, lineage. But decides uh, to turn his activism into bringing about justice, but using religion as his model. Maybe all be better just in the reading of that biographical statement. We talked earlier about item number five, the dignity of work and the right of all workers. You know, there's been a trend over the last uh, two or three decades in this country where uh, particularly public workers, those are who are paid and hired on a local level, um, work for municipalities, the firemen, the policemen, and the teachers, um, where many um, municipalities and counties are moving away from um, maintaining the pension funds. They are moving away from the um, from the unions, which have for decades fought to bring dignity uh, to those classes of workers. Um, and it seems like once again, uh, the role of the worker 
which has been long honored uh, in American society after you know, working labor classes fought for that dignity. They fought against um, those who would be brought in sometimes to bust up those unions. Uh, we think about, you know, back as far as the auto workers. Um, Ford and others would not allow uh, the unionization and actually paid uh, thugs to break up those efforts. Here we have um, an example coming in from really the ancient and classical world. One who states that the pathway to God comes from the normal and routines of life, not the extraordinary nor the grandeur of works. When Pope Paul visited America a few years ago, and he spoke before the uh, combined session of the Senate and the Congress, he said that he was very glad to visit the land of Thomas Merton, Abraham Lincoln, Dorothy Day, and Martin Luther King. Uh, it's, it's a great piece of tape to listen to that speech. Many people, uh, may not be familiar with the works of Dorothy Day, and many others are. A convert uh, to the Catholic faith. Known by many for her work with the Catholic worker uh, newspaper. Organizing food lines. Anti-war. It says there she joined Cesar Chavez and United Farm Workers. When I mention the name uh, Chavez, many students think that's a boxer. So I often will label him as perhaps as either he is the Martin Luther King of California or Martin Luther King is the Cesar Chavez of the South. But imagine organizing for dignity people who simply pick grapes and lettuce. A Dorothy Day. Has earned her sainthood. Through her noble works. Solidarity building people together. John Paul the second. Reminds us that there's power in organization. We can also see the value of diversity and in recognizing that we are all one. You know, when, when students go to, you know, medical school, they know that once they move along uh, below the skin line, the entire human body is made up the same for all individuals. There is no Negro blood type, as was thought over 100 years ago. But there are basic blood types, our skeletal structure, our muscular structures are all the same. But yet and still too much time is spent on the superficiality of the skin that covers all of those structures. Father Damien and the lepers. Love and service require sacrifice. Finally, the care for creation. I find it interesting how many people have turned to the uh, the um, the monasteries uh, to become monks who have rejected uh, their wealthy existence and the 
then the last line, as you can read there, our responsibility to the environment should be grounded on the gospel. And finally, I'd like to thank you all for uh, being kind and patient through the technical difficulties. We are now going to take at least a 30 minute um, lunch break where you may refresh yourselves. Um, we're going to be starting an interlude probably at about 10 after we have a presentation by the premier dance company uh, that will be running prior to the time we will start. I will attempt to start. I'm going to suggest at about um, 1220, a little bit earlier. If Dr. Carter hopefully is available and Dr. Mott, um, just so that we can um, reclaim as much time as we, we possibly can for the afternoon sessions. Uh, we hope that this morning session has been a blessing for all of you, particularly the, the students, uh, in terms of equipping you uh, with whole uh, different perspectives of understanding Dr. King, but also, I would say King in the framework of the larger historical analysis. Um, and also, we've added uh, an understanding of Catholic social thinking and, and thought as a larger framework. Um, so we'll see you all uh, just about 12, 15 ish. And uh, once again, for that um, interlude where the premier dance company has designed a number of dance movements and pieces, which will honor the civil rights movement. Um, their presentation will be approximately, I think, 10 to 15 minutes long. Um, so that will be uh, part of the entertainment that will be offered. And hopefully we'll be uh, ready to resume at approximately 1220 this afternoon. Thank you all very much for your time and attention and enjoy your break. Thank you.